And this one is going to be on a topic, well, uh, Freiman's 3K minus 4 theorem is our main topic. Uh, but let's sort of start with a general thing we've seen from the last few lectures. So we've had our sum set. And here's the sort of the general idea that if we have the sum set being small, whatever that's supposed to mean, then this is supposed to imply that A, B, A plus B a structure. Right, this is a nothing precise uh, with the song quotes. But the, the last theorem we saw from the previous lecture is an example of this, right? We saw that we were below this bound. And that implies we have a precise if and only if characterization. So that was the Kepperman structure theorem. Uh, so it's an example of this type of structure here. And we, not just like, you know, having structure, we actually know exactly what the set looks like in most cases. There are these four critical pairs and this one way of quasi-periodic lifting. And between combining those processes, we can create every possible uh, sum set that has the smaller cardinality. But there are lots of other examples of theorems along these lines. And that's just one very specific uh, example. There's another one that's perhaps more famous. Uh, it's called Freiman's theorem. So for this one over here, we're dealing with integer subsets. And let's just say we have A equal to B contained inside Z, of course, finite and non-empty. Uh, and say we just know that the the sum set is small, say less than some constant, a fixed constant, less times the, the cardinality of the original set. So it's growing sort of linearly. So Freiman's theorem basically says that this is only possible if we can sort of approximate A. This means there exists a multi-dimensional progression so that A is contained inside P. P isn't too large. So a multi-progressional dimensional progression, we know what an arithmetic progression is. A multi-dimensional progression is just a sum set of various arithmetic progressions. So if you think about an arithmetic progression, you're allowed to go with one direction. You increase by just this difference d, but for a multidimensional progression, you have r different differences, and you're always allowed to increase in either any of the r directions. Like you sort of would in like a two-dimensional space if you were in a square. Or three-dimensional space, you were in a cube, you'd have three directions to move in. So a multidimensional progression just is sort of that, except what you have more than one difference. And Freiman's theorem says that basically this is a small sum that's only possible if a is a large subset of a multi-dimensional progression. And by large, it means it's a, you know, some constant progression is no more than a constant multiple of A, and that constant only depends upon, you know, this doubling constant, C. It doesn't depend upon A. So this is an asymptotic result over here. It says that for large A, you sort of view have the linear growth, and you get linear growth over here for the approximating result. Uh, we're not gonna prove this result. This is actually a, a fairly difficult result to prove. Um, Sugimara Adikari was talking about Van der Voorden's theorem in the last lecture. So Van der Voorden's theorem is this, uh, this result about looking for monochromatic arithmetic progressions. 
it doesn't uh, seem like it would have anything to do with some sets at all. There's, there's no, it's not really apparent at all why this should be the case. Uh, and there were very, very bad bounds for Vanderborn's theorem. The original proof was the bounds were uh, very large. The, the type that you have hard, trouble comprehending just how large those numbers are. And Sukima wrote another bound on the, the board that looked gigantic, but it was still much smaller than what, what was known originally for Vanderborn's theorem. Uh, and so the original proof of Gowers that actually did this huge improvement in the order of magnitude and how, how long you had to go out to guarantee monochromatic arithmetic progressions actually used Freiman's theorem. So while these uh, results involving some sets don't always seem like they're directly related to other things, they, they can pop up in unusual circumstances sometimes. Now we're not going to talk about the, this one in general. We're going to talk about a, a special case. So something is called the, the Freiman 3K minus 4 theorem. So here's its uh, original form. You have A inside Z. And it has small sum set 3 times its cardinality minus 4. And let's say that uh, A plus B, I'm sorry, A plus A is equal to A plus A plus R. We'll just give a little parameter. We know R is at least negative 1, right? Because we have this, in a torsion-free group, we have this lower bound that's always at least negative 1. Let's just say we have R more beyond the, you know, the trivial bound. How much beyond the trivial bound are we? And the... The result of Freiman is that there exists a normal pro arithmetic progression it contains a and it doesn't have too many holes r plus 1 at most so that the the difference the you know the progression is short in comparison to the length of a there's you know for every one you go above the trivial bound you get an extra gap inside the progression, a single hole. And so if you actually were right at the trivial bound, this is saying that A must be an arithmetic progression. And if you're one above that, well, then it's an arithmetic progression with one element removed. If you're two above it, with two elements removed. And this keeps on going until you hit this threshold bound here, 3A minus 3. Once you're beyond th up to 3A minus 3, different stuff can possibly happen. Now, these constants here are actually precise. The constants for Freiman's theorem are not even asymptotically known, although it's, it's fairly close. And the, even the, this statement of Freiman's theorem is probably not the, the most accurate one. The, it's using multidimensional arithmetic progressions to approximate the sets. Uh, and it's believed that, well, there are examples showing that that's probably not the, the most efficient structure to use. Um, but over here, these constants are accurate. So let's, let's show some examples. Consider this set over here, 0, 2, 4, all the way up to 2R. And then we're going to union it with the interval 2R plus 2 up to A plus R. Right, just check to see how, how big is this set. Well, there are R plus 1 elements in that first portion of the set. And there should be A minus r minus 1 elements in this interval. And together, that gives cardinality of a elements. So this really is a set of cardinality a. And we look at how many elements uh, p is just this progression that's going to be 0 to a plus r. Because right? uh, we're not going to be able to cover the set a by any shorter progression. It has to start at 0 and go to a plus r. We'll need definitely difference 2, 1, assuming this interval has at least difference 2 there. There's two elements there. Uh, and this is exactly this bound here. This, of course, is equivalent to saying that the size of P is at most A plus R plus 1. So we have a, a tight bound there. There are A plus R plus 1 elements inside that progression. We can't do better than this bound. What about that bound 3A minus 4? Could we extend that one up? Well, that's, that's not the case either. So just imagine A is a union of two arithmetic progressions. So A1 and A2 are both progressions of difference 2.
And let's assume that A1 plus A1, A1 plus A2, and A2 plus A2 are all disjoint sets. So how could we do this? There, there are various ways we could do this. For instance, we could take just A1, could be contained inside uh, D times Z, A2 to be contained inside 1 plus D times Z with D big. All right, then everything in A1 plus A1 is 0 mod D. Everything in A1 plus A2 is 1 mod D. Everything in A2 plus A2 is 2 mod D, and those are all distinct residue classes. So they'll all be distinct. And if D is very large, we're, we're never going to be able to get an accurate bound of the number of holes, because there be, it's going to depend on, upon D. And D could be huge. So there's actually no way to bound the number of holes inside a, a normal arithmetic regression in this case. We would really need something higher dimensional to cover A. We couldn't just use a one-dimensional arithmetic regression. And what is the bound if we sort of take a look at the sum set for this? Well, A plus A is going to be everything in A1 plus A1, everything in A1 plus A2, everything in A2 plus A2. These are all disjoint sets. It says that our arithmetic progressions, this is 2 times the cardinality of A1 minus 1, A1 plus A2 minus 1, and 2 times A2 minus 1. So what this looks like is we have three copies of A1, three copies of A2, and a, a negative 3 there. But A1 and A2 partition A, so this is just 3 times A minus 3. So there's that threshold bound. It's one more than this bound over here, and we can, there's no chance of necessarily bounding our, our set inside an arithmetic progression of bounded size. So both the, the hypothesis and the conclusion are as tight as it could be, sort of in this sense over here. What do you mean? Uh, what, what is the question? Yes. There is none for this one. That's the problem. You, you can't do this because uh, right, this, this difference d could be huge. Right, you, you, it, it's going to be have to have, you have difference one if you want to cover it because the if they're, they're right next to each other, so you would need to use an arithmetic regression with difference one to cover this set. And if D is huge, the number of holes inside the progression is going to depend upon D, not, not upon, so it, this theorem is basically false, is what I'm saying, is if you make this minus three. Yeah. Now this was the original way the theorem was stated by Freiman uh, when it was, he first proved it, but there are uh, since been many generalizations of this result. So let me put down a generalization that involves A plus B. This doesn't erase so well when it's wet. So here we're going to have A and B be subsets of Z with B the smaller cardinality set. And now we're going to suppose that A plus B has size at most A plus two times the smaller cardinality minus, well, minus three minus delta, where delta equals one. A and B are translates. And delta equals zero otherwise. Right, so it's sort of the, if the sets are the same up to translation, we say we set it equal to one. We get the same bound as the Feynman 3K minus four theorem. If they're not, we're allowed to go one further 
up to three, minus three over here. The conclusion, well, let's write A plus B is A plus B plus R, with R being at least negative one. By the, again, that basic bound for torsion-free sets. And the conclusion are there are two progressions. Common difference with A inside PA, B inside PB, and the number of holes In both cases, most R plus one. So you can see this one generalizes the, the symmetric case, because it reduces down to what we just said before, and except now we can do it with an A is not equal to B. In fact, we can go one further if they're not translates to each other all the way up to this constant delta, although I'm, we're not going to deal too much with that but you can uh, adjust the arguments to get a slight improvement. So this theorem was proved by Freiman, uh, and later given a different, some extensions, uh, a different proof, with a slightly more generality by Levin Schmeliansky, uh, and Stanchesco then derived, gave an argument that derived uh, the original result from Lev's result. So how does one go about proving this over here? Now, I'm not going to talk about the original proof of Freiman. I want to talk about a, a different idea, the one that was by Levin Smilansky. So this is an idea of modular reduction. So the idea is we have a problem that's in the integers. But we're not going to stay in the integers. We're going to move to a, a finite group. And we're going to start, we have a small sum set hypothesis over here in the integers, and we're going to reduce this integer small sum set problem to a small sum set problem modulo n, but with a smaller bound, a stronger bound. In fact, it'll be strong enough that we can apply Knazer's theorem. And we'll use the structure, the weak structure from Knazer's theorem, to lift up and prove the structure in the integers. That's the basic idea. But of course, how does it actually work? Uh, there's, there's some details we need to work out. So let's suppose n over here is going to be an integer. A and b are, are finite, non-empty subsets. And I'm going to let pn just be the natural homomorphism. I'm reducing everything modulo n. Maybe I'll just sometimes write x is x bar. We'll see. So all we're doing is we're going to reduce things modulo n. Now we need to have some notation. So for alpha and a, let's look at this uh, coset slice. Alpha plus n z intersect a. And we'll do the same thing if al alpha is inside uh, A modulo n. So I'm not going to distinguish whether this is a, an actual element here, or if, if it's also a residue class, it's going to represent the same coset slice, because this is independent of, of which representative we use. So we're just looking at the elements of A that are congruent to alpha modulo n. Do the same thing for beta inside B. We'll let B beta be the coset slice over here. So these are all the elements of B that are congruent to beta modulo n. Whether beta is an integer or an, an element, a residue class, we, we don't care. We'll use the same notation. All right. Now, let's let A zero just be A reduced modulo 
So this is really all x and a, so that um, Oh, let's maybe make this, I'll make this an x, and this a y. Just so we don't, because we're going to use the, the z here, so they'll look different. x alpha is at least one, right? Means that there's at least one element of a, which is congruent to x. And let's define A1 to be all the elements in A that have two representatives, modulo n. Um, A1, A2, A3. A3 will be everything with three representatives, modulo n, and so on. Right, so AI is just going to be everything that we have I distinct elements of our set A, which are congruent to the same element, alpha. So alpha to be inside here means there are three elements inside A which are all congruent to alpha, to be inside A3. And A2 is, well, these are all subsets of Z mod N. So we reduce everything modulo N. So we're just looking at the residue classes that have lots of representatives in A. So if there's at least one, we're inside A1. If that residue class has at least two representatives in A, we're inside A2, and so on, it's A3. We'll do the same thing for B. So, means alpha inside AS corresponds to X alpha having S elements. Beta inside BT corresponds to Y beta having T elements. Right? There are S representatives for this residue class alpha. So where is this all going? Let's define this A twiddle to be the union of A S cross S, or S at least one. And B twiddle will be the union of all these B T's cross T. So these all live inside Z mod N Z cross Z. And we note that they have the same cardinality of, so A twiddle has the cardinality of A, B twiddle has the cardinality of B, right, because these are residue classes. For every residue class in here, we have exactly S copies inside A. So it's, if there were exactly S copies inside A, then that element occurs in A1 up to AS. If that element inside A has S minus one copies, it occurs in A1 up to AS minus one, so there are the same number of times it occurs. So the, the cardinality hasn't changed over here. We're just sort of redistributing elements. And the claim is that A plus B is at least A twiddle plus B twiddle. So let's see why this is true. So let's try and get uh, a count for how many elements are inside A plus B. So let's let Z not be inside A plus B. And we're going to ask the question, how many elements of A plus B are congruent to Z not mod N? Because if we know this, we can just like, sum over all the residue classes and get the total number of elements in A plus B. So where do these elements live? Well, each such is 
is in some x alpha plus y beta. with all these equal to z naught mod n. Remember, these are all the same residue class. They're all just a single residue class modulo n. These are all the elements of single residue class modulo n, and this has to equal that residue class z naught. So I, in fact, the, this number is equal to the cardinality of the union of all these. x alpha plus x beta, where they represent the right residue class. Because whenever we take things that are congruent to alpha and congruent to beta, which sum up to z naught module n, we just look at all the, the things inside the, the cos of it. It's possible for we sum them up. That's everything. This is the number right there. Let's estimate this number. So in the worst case for making this small, all these sets are nested together. And this union is just the size of the largest one. So it's always at least the maximum of all these sets. And we can use that Cauchy, uh, the, the bound for torsion-free sets. We know since these are both not empty, this is at least the max of x alpha plus y beta minus 1 over all possible choices of x alpha and beta whose sum is z naught mod n. So there's a lower bound. Now let's look at the a twiddle plus b twiddle. Let's ask ourselves the question, how many elements of a twiddle plus b twiddle have first coordinate equal to z naught mod n? And so here's a separate question. Well, Let's define a twiddle plus b twiddle as the union of a bunch of ck's, k being at least 2 across ck, with ck just being the union of all the as plus bt with s plus t equaling k. So this is a subset of z mod n z. So this is a nice arithmetic progression. The a twiddle is just all well, this sort over here. So if we want to see what's in the, as the coordinate k here, it's just everything that has to add up, something that with s plus t that adds up to k. It's an arithmetic progression in the, the right-hand side. We note that C2 is strictly bigger than C3, which is strictly bigger than C4, and, and so on, right? Because each of these sets, AS, as we increase the index, gets strictly smaller. It's a subset. Right? A1 contains A2, contains A3. B1 contains B2, contains B3, because these are the, A1 is just all the elements, all the residue classes that have one element inside A. So if it has, these have two, if it has two, it has one at least. A3 is all the elements in A that have at least three residue, cla residue classes that have at least three elements in A congruent to it. If there are at least three, there's also at least two, at least one. We have all these inclusions. So all these sets here are included over there. We have, we get inclusions over there. So the number is just, in answer to this question, it equals L. where CL plus 1 equals the max All right, so we're just looking for this residue class 
If he not is going to live inside here, we want the, the one, the largest indexed one that lives inside there. So it starts out with two up to CL plus one, so we'd have L different classes there. Eventually we'll get down here to CL plus one, and if this is the last one that contains Z naught, then afterwards it's no longer there, and so it's inside L. So we just need to figure out, well, what this is. So if Z naught's inside here, this is a union of all these AS plus BT with S plus T equaling L plus 1. So Z naught is equal to some alpha plus beta with alpha inside AS, beta inside BT. What does that mean? That means X alpha has size at least S. Y beta has size at least T. And X alpha plus Y beta is equal to Z naught mod N. We get all these. And there are the, the definitions of these that correspond to having this many elements there. And since Z naught is in there and these are just residue classes, these have to correspond to this happening. So that means x naught plus y naught, that's at least s plus t, equals l plus 1. If I add a minus 1 there, this becomes l. And that's this bound over here. So. For every residue class mod n, the number of elements inside a plus b is at least l, which is the number of first coordinates that occur inside this one over here. If we sum over all first coordinates for the a-twiddle sets, we get all the elements of a-twiddle plus b-twiddle, because they're all partition mod n and the, by the first coordinate. So if we sum over all possible residue classes, we get just the cardinality of a-twiddle plus b-twiddle. As we sum over all the, the elements of a plus b over the possible residue classes, we get the cardinality of a plus b, and because these Inequalities are the same right there, we get the claimed inequality. Now that's a basic way we can use how we can use modular reduction. We can now see that we could take our set, reduce it modulo n, and if we get a bound for a, this set over here, which is involving you know, some residue classes in the first coordinate, we get a bound for the a's afterwards. Uh, but it's sometimes not good enough because this is actually losing a lot, that inequality over there. So I want to talk about a way where we can sometimes do a little bit better in certain circumstances. So to keep it simple, let's consider the following circumstance. A and B contained inside Z. I'm going to translate them so that the minimum of both of them is zero, just a normalization hypothesis. And I'm going to let N be the maximum of A. We're going to use a modular reduction with n. All right, so that means that a1 is just a reduced mod n. Uh, sorry, a0. Uh, no, I did a1. B1 
is B, reduce modulo n. A2 is just the element 0, right, because it's, A is contained between 0 and n. There's actually only one element that's repeated twice, n. It has 0 and n. There's two elements in that one. All the ones have one unique element modulo n. So, and then everything else is the empty set afterwards. And so on. But we don't know about B, B, the BIs. They could be different. We're not sure whether they're empty or not. Now, we can get a slightly better bound. Let's define this is going to be the max between 0. Do it over here. Or we're going to sum over all possible slices. So here we're going to have this fixed subgroup. So let's let g be z mod nz, and h is going to be a subgroup. And for a z that's inside g mod h, we're going to look at uh, this quantity over here. So it's always going to be at least 0. But if we can do better, we'll look at uh, all possible slices of h. These are with the b naughts over here. So this is now modulo n. So how many elements are inside this h closest slice mod n? Plus this one over here, minus 1 minus h. You know, if there, there were no, if this could be theoretically h plus h minus 1, at most h minus 1. And here's the, the claim. We actually get a plus b being at least a naught plus b naught plus the cardinality of b, plus the sum of all these delta z's as we range over everything that's inside a plus b, but not inside b modulo n. So we get some improvements. We're going to have a bound over here in terms of these modular reductions, and then something that's slightly more. Let me just briefly explain why this is the case. We have A1, we have A2, that's 0. Then we have over here B1, B2, B3 all the way up to something, I don't know, bt, the last one that's not empty. And these should all be ones. Because I normally write them with zeros, but I wrote them with ones in this lecture. So when you want to think about a twiddle corresponds to, you know, just pairing up a, an a say i with a bj, and that corresponds to something inside cj. And we know the cardinality, right, this is just the sum of all the cks. Right, because they, these are all destroyed, they have different second coordinates inside a twiddle. This is literally equal to ck, c1 cross 1, c2 cross 2, and so on. And the cks are just found by adding up an a to a b with the, the indexes adding up to k. So for instance, A1 plus B2 lives inside C3. And A2 plus B1 also lives inside C3. A1 plus B3 lives inside C4. So we're just going to look over here. We, we can sort of pair this one up here. That's the unique one that lives inside C2. That's A1 plus B1. And now we can also pair up this fashion over here. 
right? A2 can be paired up with 1, 2, 3, 4. That's going to live inside 1 plus 2, 3, 4, 5. They're all different CIs. And between all of them, we get the cardinality of A1 plus B1 plus the sum of all the BIs, because there's just a single element there, and the sum of all the BIs is B. So there's B. The only thing left is to explain why we get some bonus terms afterwards. Right, so what this is really saying is that the elements inside A1 plus B1, they're, they're, anything that's inside that set, A1 plus B1, has at least one element of A which is congruent to it modulo n. So if you're in A1 plus B1, that inside the set A plus B, hmm? we're not even using them. We could, but we're ignoring them. This is just an estimate. Yeah, there could be more elements there. Exactly. But we're, for estimate purposes, we're going to ignore that. Yes. Yeah, so there, the theory there could be more elements here that we're, we're just ignoring them, but we only need a lower bound. So this will be a, an easier one to see, because to take into account all the, the possibilities is maybe a little unwieldy. We could do that if we were being more, uh, if we need to be more precise. This corresponds to Right, so for every element in here, we have an element of A plus B, which is congruent to it at modulo n. And the elements over here, well, we're basically saying we have not just one, we have an extra one. If over here we have two of them, or three of them, or t of them, besides that one. But all these elements over here, these ones here just have one element, mod n, and all these elements are inside the zero plus b1. They're all inside b mod n. So this bound over here simply counts one element mod n for a plus b, plus some additional elements that are all inside the equal to something inside b modulo n. So any element that's not inside b mod n, and has it more than one representation inside a plus b, will be an improvement. All right, because here we just say there's at least one element and here where you have all the elements that are mod inside b mod n, so any element that's not in b mod n, it's inside the sum set but has at least two representatives modulo n would be an improvement. Well, what does this say? This says that there, there are at least this many elements that are equal to alpha mod, well, this, this, whatever this congruence class is. And there's this many elements over here inside this, this congruence class. We know uh, by the pigeonhole principle, and when we add these together, we, we get everything, if this is going to be positive. Inside z, we will get at least this many elements minus one, right? All inside the, con the congruence class that corresponds to this. So this element, it's, it's not inside b. It's a, it's a separate congruence class that lives completely disjoint from b because z is not inside uh, this, this set over here. At worst, all h of them were already counted by a1 plus b1. For instance, they were all inside A1 plus B1, they, they wouldn't be new. We already counted one element for every element that occurs as A plus B mod N. Everything more than H is a second representation. That means we have some element, so, So we'll get an improvement by one. Um, I think it, it's the subgroup that's going to come out of, we, we say for this to work, we need a some dense concentration on two, uh, a coset. So if we have a lot of elements in this coset, a lot of elements in this coset over here, it was actually better not to use the modular reduction for that coset. It was actually just better to use the trivial bound inside z. So we're saying it was a poor choice to reduce for this coset over here. We should have just applied the trivial bound inside z instead. Uh, and this bound is going to come out because we're going to use Kinesius theorem. 
And Canadian's theorem is going to say we, we don't have very many holes, so this is going to be large, and it's going to be an error correction. Because when we add uh, this bound, well, let's see how this just works, basically. I'm not going to explain this anymore, so if, if that was a little too vague, uh, you can look up the actual details and read through them. But this is all that's really going on. Uh, so we're going to use, I'll write down over here, that inequality. Requires zero so let's try and prove the 3k minus 4 theorem we're actually going to prove a variant of it but this is going to contain all the the bulk of the work and the rest can be reduced down to this case over here so let's do this version of the 3k minus 4 theorem and assume that a and b are inside z. Uh, let's say that 0 equals the minimum of a equals the minimum of b. We'll just translate them so that's the case. Uh, let's say the GCD of a equals 1. And the diameter, let's say the maximum element of a is bigger than the maximum moment of B. Sorry? Ah, oh, A1 again, yes, I'm, I'm so used to using knots there. Uh, and we're going to suppose that A plus B is at most A plus 2 times B minus 4. I'm going to ignore the, the delta over here for simplicity, so we're just simply going to prove this theorem over here when it's like that. Let's, let's not worry about it. The, the delta can be dealt with just by looking at the arguments and realizing that you can improve them by 1 in certain when a is not a translated b. So the essence of the argument is, can be dealt with when delta is basically equal to 1, so let's just keep things a little simple. Uh, here's the hypothesis. We don't assume that b is the smallest cardinality. Now we assume it corresponds to the smaller diameter set. So a is between 0 and n. B is between 0 and something that's at most n, the smaller diameter set. That means we get the desired conclusions. So there exists our PA and our PB arithmetic progressions with common difference. In fact, 1 with A inside PA, B inside PB. And these both at most r plus 1, where r is the, as we defined before. All right, so it looks a slight variation. But if we can prove this, we can actually reduce the, the general case down to it afterwards if we have enough time. What we're going to do is we're going to use modular reduction because we have the setup we need for this inequality over here. So again, we have A1 is just A mod n. A2 is just the element 0. B1 is B mod n. And B2 is either 0 or the empty set, right? Because we're assuming that A has n is bigger than the, the largest element of B. So in the case when they're equal, we get 0. In the case when the diameter is strictly smaller, we get nothing there. And then this is actually just everything. But the key thing we need is that a1 equals a minus 1, and b1 is at least b minus 1. All right. So let's use this bound over here. Then we have a1 plus b1 plus the cardinality of b 
and just assuming all these were equal to zero, that's just the, the basic bound over here that holds in general, because this is always the lower bound for a twiddle plus b twiddle. This is at most a plus b, which is, uh, by assumption, a plus 2b minus 4. So what does this imply? a1 plus b1 is less than or equal to a plus b minus 4. And at worst, that's a not, uh, sorry, a1 plus b1 minus 2, right, because these are each at most one less than the element. That's below the bound where we can apply Knazer's theorem to guarantee a non-trivial period. So let's do that. I'm writing down the statement. So there it is. In terms of the number of holes, we're going to look at this geometrically, right? This says this is at least, it's actually equal to, in this case over here, but it's at least the, the size of the cardinalities minus the stabilizer plus the gaps, the number of holes. And we know the number of holes is at most h minus 2, because otherwise we'd be too big. This is what we have. Now, if h is equal to g, let's see what happens. So g is going to be here, just z mod nz, that equals n. That means a plus b is at least n plus the cardinality of b. This is equal to, or as is an upper bound, let's write it like this. All right, so we're just using this estimate now for a1 plus b1. That's equal to n. Add b, that's all zero. This has an upper bound a plus 2b minus 4. So that means n is at most. A B minus 4. Ah, don't want this one. I want this one. A plus R. Right, but that's saying what? Then the, but then. This progression here, 0 to n, has a contained inside p, with p minus a having at most r plus 1 holes. Right, because it's 0 to n, it has a plus r plus 1 elements, minus a is r plus 1. We'd be done. So this would be good. Basically, if the stabilizer is the entire group, we, it corresponds to having a small number of holes. Because we fill up everything, and everything over here, that's just, you know, that's the progression. The smallest one that we contain A is actually zero to its maximum element. It's our spent progression with difference one that contains A. Yes, uh, because we have this right over here, right? And we're assuming the stabilizer is everything, so this is equal to the cardinality of everything, which is n, because we're in z mod nz. So if we have this being, I think that must be everything, 
then we, be, uh, we get the bound right there. So we're nearly done. The only thing left to do is to handle a case when it's non-trivial. So then H is a proper finite non-trivial subgroup. And the GCD of A equals 1, so it can't be contained inside a single H coset. So there must be at least two H cosets that contain it. That means this has size at least 2, right? Because if it was all inside 1, it would correspond to having a common difference inside A, where this, this H corresponds to some D inside that divides N. And if this was all equal to 1, A would be contained in 0 to D to 2D. Wouldn't have GCD1. Now phi A plus phi B is at least phi A plus phi B minus 1, which is at least phi B plus 1 now. Uh, these are all 1s here. All right, so what this means is that there is a residue class that's not inside B modulo H. It's not going to be in here. It'll be outside of B. So let's just use, let's estimate what delta D is for this particular one over there, using this bound for the number of holes. This is, uh, according to the bound over here, where we had it would be the maximum of alpha plus H intersect A1 plus beta plus H intersect B1 minus 1 minus H. Well, that's at least 2 times the cardinality of H minus however many holes we have, minus 1 minus H, which looks to be H minus rho minus 1, right? Because in the, if there were no holes inside either of these closest slices, there'd be H here, H here, there'd be two H of them. Now there's some missing elements inside A1, at most row of them. So we'll just assume that all those missing elements are inside these two cosets, worst case. This many elements, H minus row plus one. So now all that's left to do is to improve our previous estimate. So now A plus B is at least A1 plus B1 plus b plus this number over here, h minus 1 minus rho. All right, this is equal to a1, b1 minus h plus rho plus b plus h minus 1 minus rho. And there's a whole lot of cancellation that's going on here. This cancels, this cancels. We're left with A1 plus B1 plus B minus 1, and this is at least A plus 2B minus 3. Contradiction, because we're assuming it's smaller. That's the end of the proof. Uh, so we're out of time right now, but the, this is the main case. Once we have this, it's a matter of using some combinatorial reductions, and we can actually reduce the general case down to this special diameter case. So there's actually, this is the, the, the hard work. The other work is being clever and just reducing everything down to this afterwards. Uh, and there are lots of other variants on this result. We'll maybe talk about some more of them later on. But this is one of the few examples where we have some precise bounds, say, in, in Freiman's theorem. So that'll be all for right now. Thank you.